Good uh, afternoon, good morning, wherever you may be. This is Ken Pyle with VOD, and today we have a very special guest, the vice mayor of the 10th largest city in the United States. That is San Jose, and the vice mayor is Charles Jones, otherwise known as Chappie Jones. And Chappie, we're going to talk we're talk about you, really, today, because... Okay. Uh, I know just a little bit about you. I mean, obviously, I live in San Jose here, and, and I'm in your district, and uh, I've known you for several years now. Gosh, I guess about six years. I think our first encounter was at a dunk tank, and you were graciously... <laughs> yes, you're so right. <laughs> and you graciously uh, sat underneath the dunk, dunk tank and uh, helped us raise money for a playground, and to that, I thank you. And, and I thank you for your service these past... Uh, gosh, I guess it has been almost six years, hasn't it? Uh, you, um, you know, for the, the amount of money you make, <laughs> the council members make, my gosh, the grief and the amount of hours you put in is just, uh, it's, there's a lot. And I, I, I don't think it's appreciated. Uh, maybe if, if you start watching some of these council meetings and uh, how they go on and on and knowing that that's just a sliver of the work you're doing, uh, there's a lot there. And I appreciate your service uh, to the city of San Jose. So thank you. Ken. With that. With that, I'd like to learn a little bit more about you. I know, um, you know, I know you're from Sacramento, and and about a month ago, we we learned a little bit of some of the stories that uh, I didn't really know. I'd, I maybe read about them in the local paper, but it's still not the same as hearing them directly and hearing some of those stories as far as you know how they came about. But but why don't we start a little bit about you know your childhood? You're raised in Sacramento, right? Yes, yeah, so I was born and raised in Sacramento, and uh, it was actually an interesting uh, childhood. Um, now, there's a lot of discussion going on right now about redlining, and I grew up in a neighborhood on a street, a predominantly black uh, street in a predominantly white neighborhood. So growing hmm. up, I really didn't understand what that even meant. I had a great childhood, you know, lots of friends and everything was going on on my street. It was 14th Street. It wasn't until I was older and uh, I was made aware of uh, like redlining and and some of these other issues that it, I really, I realized that the reason why my street was predominantly black was because of redlining. And it's, it's it was in a unique location because it was one street from the railroad tracks the proverbial okay. railroad tracks, right? Right. And with the poor neighborhood was on the other side of the tracks. It was down the street from a, a wastewater treatment facility and about eight blocks from an airport. <laughs> so well, was that the executive, was that the executive the airport? Executive airport. Oh, so my uncle and aunt lived on the other side. I'd go to them, uh, you know, I'd live with them for two weeks every summer. I loved it. Right. Uh, off so of Florin Road. I lived on the west side of the airport. Okay. So um, again, didn't realize it growing up, but I was on a predominantly black street on the other side of the railroad tracks in a predominantly white neighborhood uh, near a wastewater treatment facility and railroad tracks and an airport. So um, you had all those environmental issues that were uh, in my neighborhood. And I guess, whoever was making these decisions said, okay, we'll, we'll allow the black people to live on the street. And that was only on the street, you know, 14th yeah. street in our neighborhood. And they could be like a buffer to the poor or lower income neighborhood. That being said though, wow, I had a wonderful childhood. I, you know, 14th street was, was a, a vibrant dynamic street with lots of kids my age and, other kids would, you know, actually come over to 14th Street to play. And, and I also had um, a very unique opportunity to really um, get to know and become friends with literally all different types of, of, of people, different religions, different uh, races. Uh, the unique thing about my high school was that it was one fourth Asian, one fourth white, one fourth Latino, and one fourth black. Wow. So, it it was nothing to go over to a friend's house who was Jewish or go over to another person's house who was Latino or Asian or black. So there was an, an opportunity to really get to know people 
as people and as human beings, as opposed to the stereotypes or, or, or develop those prejudices about people that you don't know or haven't met. And so I really feel fortunate. I, I grew up in a, with a unique opportunity to really get to know, understand all different types of people and how they think. And, and one of the things that you, uh, when you have that opportunity, one of the things you, you realize is that by and large, we're all the same. Mm-hmm. We all have the same hopes, dreams, aspirations. And and you look at, you know, different groups, you have people who are smart, people who are, you know, not so smart, but the vast majority of people are average. That's why that's <laughs> what they call it average, yeah. right? Right. And, uh, and so you so you realize that and, and and you walk away from that experience uh I guess with a deeper understanding of of people's humanity. And that's carried with me my whole life. Yeah, and that was, you know, I would talk about the high school experience, but before that, you know, in the 60s, uh, so you were a kid like I was, maybe a couple years older, but not much. But, well, you know, a couple of the big events, I, I barely remember, I, you know, the, the Kennedy and Martin Luther King funerals and everything. I, I wasn't old enough to process it, but did they make an impression on you, those kinds of? Definitely. And even something um, like the Kennedy assassination, where I was three and a half years old, uh, I don't necessarily remember the specifics you know obviously i've seen them later on you know in in, in film and and that type of thing but and, but even at that age at three you just know something mm-hmm. <laughs> something is mo- monumental that just happened and that that's playing in your brain and again not not necessarily the specifics because you know it's, that's that's really young to really remember remember the specifics but you remember just that feeling and, and the same thing with uh, when Martin Luther King was assassinated, I was eight years old. So I, I had um, a deeper in, uh, understanding in terms of the magnitude of, of what just happened. Mm-hmm. But the, the main thing I remember is just the, the, just the feeling of just despair and, and fear and, and hopelessness that was in my house and the reaction of my parents and my grandparents and just just the feeling that things aren't gonna be okay. Yeah. Or they're never gonna be the same or things aren't gonna get better. So that was that was very prevalent during those times. Uh, I remember the, you know, the civil rights movement and the protests and you know, just having a feeling that, okay, things are really bad now, but if we just keep you know, moving forward, pushing ahead, you know, pushing against, you know, the forces that are trying to uh, oppress or suppress, you know, black folks, that things will get better. And and for a time, I I really did have that feeling. Uh, But then as time goes on, you start to see improvement, you start to see things get better. But if you really peel back the onion and look at a lot of the deeper structural or systemic issues that are in our country, and uh, then you start to realize that, you know, unless something dramatic happens, that things are gonna be the status quo or be so incremental that it will take, you know, generations to, to get to the point where we wanna be. Well, and one of the things you mentioned a month ago was uh, something that you know, clearly I would never have this in my history, but the mention of your, you know, your, your parents and talking about your grandparents challenges, right. Uh, as far as lynchings and. Exactly. Yeah. Those are the stories that we grew up with. Uh, you know, my grandparents would uh, tell me stories about how um, a, a white person would knock on their door and say, you guys better stay inside because an N word is going to get lynched today. You know, wow. those are the stories that I grew up with, uh, as well as, you know, stories of my grandmother who had, who was a seamstress, who couldn't deliver the, the clothes to the, the front door of a white person. She would have to go around the back and deliver the clothes. And just, I mean, just story after story after story of, of um, you know, their experiences. Uh, it really makes an impression, an imprint in terms of uh, how you view the world you know, how you respond to the world. And in some, in some ways, you know, your fear of the world <laughs> and, and what can happen. 
Well, I want to talk about those fears in a moment, but where uh, first, you know, where were your your grandparents? You know, where were they from? In Gainesville, Florida. Okay. Yes, the South. So, your did your parents then migrate to Sacramento or something during World War II, or what was the how'd that how'd so they get there? My mother grew up in Gainesville, Florida. And my father grew up in Michigan City, Indiana. So he he was in the North. My mother grew up in the South, and they met in college. And when they got married, he was in the Air Force. Uh, he served in the Korean War. And uh, when he came, you know, came back stateside, um, he was transferred to uh, one of the Air Force bases in Sacramento. And they liked it. They liked Sacramento. So when he got out of the Air Force, they decided to stay. Now, getting back to the redlining, did he was he able to buy a house only in certain neighborhoods? Then, yes, that's how we. Wow. Ended up in the house that that I grew up in. So, what date was that? Was that in the fifties still, or it was nineteen sixty two? Wow. Yeah, that's remarkable. And the redlining, just to be clear, that was really uh, was it based on what the bankers would would lend, or were, were there actually uh, uh, restrictions in the deeds that said you know only certain people can buy here? You know, I because this is all coming up now. Yeah. I actually, um, try to go back and see, you know, where the, um, cause you know, they have maps that you can <laughs> right, see right. That, that show the redlining. So I was trying to uh, find out if it was officially redlined or if it was just an understanding among <laughs> real estate agents and stuff that yeah, um, black people wouldn't be able to live in neighborhoods beyond this particular neighborhood or this particular street. So I don't know if it was formal or informal and I'm still trying to do some research to, to find out if it was something actually in in the deeds or in um, some type of red line, official redlining, or whether it was just strictly informal. I, I, I do know that you know there were deed restrictions here in San Jose, right in the '40s. Uh, my it was on my sister's uh, deed. Uh, yes, and it was you know so it was only, you know the '40s, right? Yeah, so I don't have a copy of the original deed. Yeah, that would be fascinating. <laughs> actually, I, yeah, if I had the time, I would probably. Uh, research that to see if it was actually in the deed or not. But I just know that in practice, that that's what was happening. So then you're in high school in the 70s. And, uh, you know, it, it sounds like a pretty good high school experience in general then. Yeah, it was great. Um, there was um, some racial tension in the high school. Every now and then there'd be some, you know, protest or, you know, activity you know, because of some incident that happened, you know, either locally or nationally, but, but by and large, um, you were pretty, pretty free to, to socialize or interact with anybody that you wanted to interact. So it wasn't, uh, it wasn't that it was segregated. Now there are some people self segregated and others didn't. So if, if your preference was to only be around black folks or, White folks being around white folks, or Asians being around Asians, or and Latinos being around Latinos, you could do that. Um, I'd say by and large, people were on a continuum. Some people only want to stick with their group. Some people preferred to spend most of their time with one group, but still, you know, socialize with other people. And yeah. and some people were all in and just I want to just be with everybody. Right. So it really was a, a interesting dynamic where you can pretty much be who you want to be. If you want to be with the nerds, you know, you can hang out with the nerds. If you want to hang out with the the, the smokers, because back then they actually had a smoking. They said, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mark too. Smoker seal. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and yeah. Or, or the, or the burnout. Or, yeah. You know, or whatever group or the jocks, whatever group right. you want to associate with, you had the freedom to do that. Uh, the sweat hogs being the classic uh, kind exactly. of personified me in the seventies. Right. It seemed like in many ways, at least, you know, where I was from, the relations were getting better, it seemed. And, and, you know, obviously I can't speak for all places. There were clearly issues, but, um, but the, uh, the welcome back Hada and the sweat hogs, I think was, you know, in some sense, aspirational, right? The kids. Yeah, no, I think that's a great reality. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Um, and it, uh, uh, and so as you were, um, going through uh, childhood, uh, anything stand out? Like for me, one, one memory that'll, uh, always remember, you know, July 20th, 1969, right? Where were you? 
Uh, July twentieth. That's a the, the, the Neil Armstrong. Moon, the, I was gonna say the moon landing. Yeah. Uh, again, it's another one of those. That's exa the exact same type of experience that I was describing earlier. I don't. I was nine years old. I don't specifically remember all the the details, but I remember the whole family was around the TV, black and yeah. white TV. Yep. And uh, and we were watching the moon landing, and you knew that this was a big deal. I mean, this was yeah, yeah. <laughs> one for the history books, and just the, the feeling of excitement and and actually, you know, um, it was it was that and my love for Star Trek. Okay. That really um, planted the seeds in terms of um, this feeling of no matter how bad things get, I'll still have that kernel of hope that things will get better because of those types of um, events like the moon landing and and other other achievements that mankind. I'm not even going to say that the, the the United States, but mankind is made to advance things forward and, and knowing that. If we want to, we can do big things, but we have to be yeah. committed to doing it. Yeah, and that's actually a very uh, good thought for this time, right? Uh, there's been some really low points in our history, and 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 yet it's come back. Yeah, I mean, you look at uh, like the 20s, you know, where the Ku Klux Klan had like two to three million active members. Wow. Who, who would march, you know, they had large marches down the middle of uh, – you know, Washington D.C., and they didn't feel compelled to wear even hoods. They were it was wow. so, you know. And then you had, uh, you know, periods in our country, you know, uh, led by people like Charles Lindbergh, you know, who are virulently uh, Lindbergh, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah, who are virulently uh, anti-Semitic, right? And uh, you know, there was a big movement there. And so we've gone through periods of our country where. Um, it's been been bleak, and I, I think that we have to give the our founding fathers, who were who were flawed people, as we all are. Flawed, yeah, right? yeah, <laughs> we're all flawed people. <laughs> yeah, we have to give them credit that they created a foundation and a document that was aspirational, and even though they're like we're flawed people, and but we want to put together this document. And this this foundation that's aspirational to be the best that we can be, and I got to give them a, a lot of credit for that because I think with through all the periods of um, trials and tribulations that this country has been through, we could always kind of go back to that those founding documents and get that roadmap in terms of where we want to go. Yeah, that's a great, uh, a great um, uh, analogy. It's it being a roadmap, right? To an aspirational, and, and clearly we're continuing. So you're you're in high school, and you mm -hmm. decide that uh, UC Davis, or not UC Davis, UC Berkeley, right, uh, is going to be your school. What kind of went into that decision process? So it was a uh, UC Davis undergrad. I graduated. Oh, it was. Yeah. I okay, I was yeah, right there. Yeah. Okay, uh, so you were right the first time. So. Um, it was uh, close to home, you know, uh, great school. I had uh, I had friends going there uh, and uh, I was able to afford to get a car in my own place. And so it just it just made a lot of sense. And I had a great uh, college experience. And then uh, I, I worked for a while and then I went back to uh, to graduate school at UC Berkeley to get my MBA. So, but you uh, did you live on campus at UC Davis? No, actually, I lived off campus. I lived. Uh, okay. I had a, um, a an apartment off campus, and uh, it was wasn't too far from campus. But yeah, I had my own place. And that was the dismal uh, dismal science, right? Uh, that you studied the economics. Was that right? That's right. I I was trying to. I actually wanted to major in business, but Davis didn't have a, a an actual business program for undergrads. So um, economics is probably the closest thing. And actually, I, I was glad that I actually majored in economics because I think throughout my life, it's really given me a good foundation in terms of um, understanding how things work. And it's, you know, it's a social science too. So you kind of, 
it gives you a grounding in terms of understanding how people think and how people yeah. react and how people respond. So it was a great foundation. Well, it is. I mean, that's um, I, I, when I started my undergraduate studies in it, it was, I think, 37% of the CEOs had an economics degree as their uh, undergrad degree. So, oh, there you go. There you go. Something like that. But so, you know, we were uh, one of the things you mentioned um, has been your encounters with the police. And mm -hmm. uh, why don't you talk to that for a moment? Because you mentioned a couple of times it's happened. Yeah, well, you know, um, again, when you're young, you don't really understand the magnitude. But I I, I can think of, you know, a couple of situations when I was a teenager and I was driving. Uh, one in particular that just really jumps out. Um, I was on a military base uh, with a couple of my buddies uh, whose their father was um, in the military, still in the military, and we we're going to the commissary. You know where you can get really good prices. Oh yeah, discount, right? No yeah, tax. Great, yeah. great discounts. Yeah. And so we're on the base. Um, I do a California roll through a stop sign. You know, look both ways. You know, no cars coming. You know, in any directions. And I do a little California roll, and I get pulled over by a, a military police officer. So you know, they pull you over. They ask, you know, do you know why I pulled pulled you over? I said, you know. I think because I, you know, did a California roll through that stop yeah. sign or whatever. And then the next thing I know, he's searching my car. Huh. And at the time, particularly at my age, it's just like, you know, if you said, if you're telling me you want to search my car, I'm like, okay. So he's, he searches my car and um, in, in my trunk, actually one of my buddies and I didn't even know this. One of my buddies had put a billy club in my trunk. Oh. <laughs> and so he picks up the billy club and um, he says, you know, this is illegal to have a billy club. First of all, I didn't know it was in my trunk. And two, yeah. I didn't know it was illegal. Yeah, I had no idea until just now. I think for <laughs> yeah. telling me that, I'll have to take <laughs> mine out yeah. of my trunk. Yeah. It's good for uh, future reference, right? Yeah. So, um, and so he, he probably saw the look on my face of just sheer like, <laughs> you know, surprise and shock. And so uh, he said, okay, I'm going to write you a ticket and I'm going to, uh, I'm not going to, um, you know, arrest you or, you know, for this Billy Club. But the reason why I'm telling you the story is because if he, if that military police officer just wanted to be a jerk or didn't have a, any empathy that, you know, mm -hmm. I was totally surprised. Right. I could have been arrested, uh, you know, wow. bringing, it, bringing an illegal weapon on a military oh, yeah, onto base. a military base, yeah. And can you imagine the impact that would have had on my on my life and my future? And and the reason why I'm telling you the story is because that happens millions and millions of times where African American folks are pulled over, the cars are searched. They might find a billy club or something mm -hmm. else. And a white driver, same situation, who had a billy club in the trunk, right. doesn't get the car searched, doesn't get arrested, and doesn't have the direction of their life changed. So um, that's one incident that really stands out. I had been stopped other times, you know, for, you know, some what I would consider legitimate reasons, you know, speeding or whatever, and others that I thought were not legitimate. Uh, I've been caught up in, a, uh, when I was at UC Davis, and a, um, the police uh, were rounding up black men because three black males had robbed a liquor store. And instead of like actually doing their police work and <laughs> using yeah, the, trying to identify, yeah. Yeah, they were just like rounding up all the black men that were out. <laughs> Really, and I was uh, I was caught up in that, and a couple of my buddies were actually had guns drawn on them, and they were, you know, up against the car, and you know they were questioning me and you know my other friends, and uh, and it, after they were done, I, I looked at the officer, and I said, "So tell me, be honest, did I really fit the description of the person you were looking for?" And he just kind of gave me a little sly, little smile, and just you know, walked away. Yeah, but. I mean, those kind of things just really just, you know, make an impression that, you know, you're talking about a group of 
college students, you know, some that are going to go on to become doctors, lawyers, judges, you know, vice mayors. <laughs> and all, all they saw us as is, you know, fitting some very, you know, vague description, you know, black males. Right. And it, with no effort to really kind of, you know, what were they, what, what, what were they wearing? You know, what was their skin complexion? You know, how tall were they? I mean, just right. Kind of Other, right. More metadata, right? <laughs> yeah. <basically. laughs> yeah. So it's the, just one item versus right. uh, Yeah. So, so, you know, think about that, those types of incidents happening to literally millions of people, millions of times. And it starts to, to, to really wear on you. Yeah. Emotionally and psychologically, it just it just wears on you. I um I was in a text uh, group with uh, twenty African American men, and one of the guys sent uh, out a text and said, "Tell me about the time when the police drew a gun on you." And about half of the uh, participants in that text group actually had a story of when the police drew a gun on them. Wow. And, and Ken, I'm, t I'm talking about, there were two, two uh, doctors in that chat group, one retired uh, military, um, high ranking military person, a scientist, uh, other professionals, a vice mayor of the city of San Jose. Oh, <laughs> you have you had a gun pulled on you too? No, but I was oh, okay. I, I did. Yeah, okay. I had not had a gun. Pull, okay, pull on but me. you were on the other half of that then. <laughs> I was, I was the other pulled. kid. Okay. Yeah. You know, I all I could do was tell stories about people I knew who had guns. Yeah. Pulled. Yeah, and I. Yeah. I, yeah. Wow. But I just wanted to just tell you the yeah. you know, the group. Right. So college graduate professional high achievers, and and about half of them were able to to tell a story of when the police drew a gun on them. Yeah, and I mean, these are the kinds of things, too, that aren't necessarily picked up in statistics, right? And it's a perception thing, right? I mean. Yeah, it's, it's totally a perception thing. Yeah. Um, and, and, and again, it particularly for Black professionals and, and um, Black folks who have made an effort to try to assimilate and adapt, you know, this is really the first time in our lives that we've been actually able to, to share these stories or even felt comfortable enough to, to share these stories. We come to ourselves. Yeah. Even yeah, though that's... it was going on the whole time, you know, a year ago or two years ago, Ken, I, I probably wouldn't have felt as comfortable sharing these stories with you that, that I'm sharing right now. Yeah, that's... Um... It's amazing. I have a, a friend who uh, kind of enlightened me this about this maybe 10 years ago or so. It's the same thing where he's, you know, rounded up, scooped up because he's in the you know, like three blocks away from there. There was a robbery and, you know, he's up against the police mm -hmm. car. Right. And yeah. Um, yeah. No reason for him to be part of that group that was, you know, he didn't look yeah. like the suspect. Right. Yeah. I mean, just yeah. I mean, for someone to be empathetic, I mean, just imagine if three white men rob a liquor store. Yeah. The police were running around, rounding up <laughs> right. all the white, men, white males that they, they encountered. Yeah, it just doesn't right. make sense. Yeah. <laughs> you know, so, yeah, so those are the kind of things that, you know, again, um, things are just you, you deal with, you face, but, you know, they, they wear you down. I, I, yeah. I was a victim of uh, housing discrimination. I, I even really, yeah, in about 1984, 84. 8485, um, I, uh, me and a, a, fr a good friend, both African American, uh, wanted to get an apartment in Fremont. And uh, so we called, and, there, and the, the manager was like, Oh, yeah, we got tons of apartments. Come on down. We come down. Oh, we don't have any apartments. Wow. Okay, this is kind of sketchy. But, yeah. So we wait a couple of days, call back. Oh yeah, we got a lot of apartments. <laughs> we go down, <laughs> and then it's like we don't have any apartments. Now, I, at, at the time, I think I was working at um, General Electric. I was in finance at General Electric. My 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 buddy, I think, was working at Lawrence Livermore Labs. Okay. You know, 
he was, a, he was an engineer and, you know, professional, you know, good incomes. Mm -hmm. And all he saw was skin color, huh? Yeah. And um, so anyway, so we actually filed a housing complaint and won. Wow. And, and I called actually about two weeks ago, I had texted my, my friend and I said, do you still have a copy of the, uh, the housing complaint? Cause I'm going to start telling the story. Yeah. <laughs> and if somebody ever like challenged, yeah, you'll have the the evidence. Yeah, I got, you know, I got the paperwork and he found it. He found yeah. it, he kept it, kept it from all, all this time. But yes, we, uh, we won the housing complaint. Uh, and the manager actually, the uh, housing uh, complex uh, got fired. Wow. Because of it. Wow. And, uh, but again, just, you know, just one more example of just the kind of things that you have to, to, to put up with or, you know, challenges that we, we have in our lives that, you know, we just didn't talk about. Well, well and that it is important because um, the fact that 19, you know, 1984, well, to young Pearson, it probably seems like it is ancient history, but it wasn't that long ago. Wasn't that long ago. Yeah. No, that's, that's incredible. Yeah. But it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's happening now. It's, it's happening to, to my kids. Uh, you know, I, I tell the story about my son who, when he was in high school, uh, he was going to a, a tutor in Campbell. And right down the street from where he was, um, where the tutor was located, was a little park. And the, and the park had this, this bench. And it was right off the main drag in, in Campbell. So anyway, it was kind of later in the evening. Uh, so my son was going to sit down and wait at that park bench for me to pick him up. So he goes over to the park bench. There's a white lady that's sitting on the bench. She's on one end. He goes and sits on the other end. So she, as soon as he sits down, he gets up and moves over to a, another area. Hmm. And um, when I picked him up, you know, he, he told me about it. And I could see the, you know, the expression on his face. Because, I mean, he knew exactly what was going on. Yeah. But he didn't really understand. He was kind of struggling with like kind of why, you know, and, and my son, if if you you might have met him, but he's the most easygoing, non-threatening. He's like, he's like you. <laughs> yeah. Person you ever want to meet. But the fact that when he sat down on that bench and that woman saw a young black male, she immediately responded by moving away to find um, a safe distance. Uh, because of the fear she had of him. And, and that made a big impression on him, right? That made I mean, a big impression on him. Uh, and then also, um, he, um, one day I was looking at his uh, yearbook, right? And you look at, you know, your kids' yearbooks and, you know, it's notes from their friends saying, hey, you know, it's great to spend this time with you and, you know, look forward to, you know, seeing you in the future or you have a bright future, whatever. Half of the notes in his yearbook has something to do with him being black, huh. in, including some very liberal use of the N word. Really? Yeah. And really? Like other comments like, I bet you love, you love watermelon. Really? Uh, one, there was one uh, page in his yearbook that was just a, a black page, but you could see where somebody wrote in, Hey, Peyton, this page is black like you. And it was just, wow. it was just full of that. And so I saw that and I went to the school and showed it to his counselor. And I'm like, well, this is not, it's not acceptable. Right. Um, and they looked at it and they're like, yeah, this is not acceptable, but they never did, never did anything. Huh. It just, it just ended there. Yeah. But, and these were his, you know, his friends or so-called friends. Right. And I, I'm not saying that, that their comments were necessarily malicious or they actually realized the impact of what they were saying. Right. But it's the psychological yeah. impact. You know, how does Peyton define himself now? Is he the black kid at school or is he Peyton the human being? Yeah. You know, is, is being the black kid in school like a negative, <laughs> you know? Well, and, 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 and where you are too, I mean, he really uh, is is a minority, right? I mean, there, yeah. he was one there, of five. Yeah, wow. In a school of almost two thousand, he was one of five. Yeah, 
So but there was, there was nothing, even when I brought it to the school's attention, there was there was no effort to say, you know, this is not good. Let's figure out a way to support our few black <laughs> students that we have or, you know, future students or, you know, it was, it was none of that. It was just kind of like, oh, this is not good. Oh, well. But again, it's that psychological impact. And some of it, he does, he probably didn't even realize or wasn't conscious of, but I was conscious of it because I know what the, the long-term impacts of that are. Uh, my daughter, who uh, was going to um, a surprise birthday party for one of her best friends over in the Silver Creek area, parked her car um, a couple of houses down because, you know, you don't want to, <laughs> you know, when you're trying to surprise somebody, you don't want to have your car parked right in front of the house, right? So she parks her car down down the street from the house and then starts to walk over to the house. Well, a white gentleman saw her and came out and confronted her as to why she was in the neighborhood and what was she doing. So again, just another example of, and these, these are not old stories. I mean, my kids aren't that old. So it's just another example of how you just have these millions and millions of interactions every day that just just wear you down or just wear on you. So it's tough. It's tough on my kids, and we tried to shield them from it, but um, you can only shield them from it so much. Oh, Thank you. I lost you there for a minute. Yeah, that is the weirdest thing. I, I think it's still recording. Um, yeah, well, it looked like it was recording. So Okay. I, when, did, uh, when did I lose you? You lost me at... Um, so your son had just um, had. You know, hopefully, I've got all that, and I can put it back together. But um, he, he had just. Uh, you, you're talking about the school and the fact that you know there's five, uh, uh, five black African kids. Yeah. Kids, yeah. Yeah. What do you prefer, by the way, African American or black? I go both. I go either way. Okay. Okay. Like everybody uh, else, you know, I, I might, I, I might, I might go either way in the same sentence so yeah okay uh, i uh, yeah i had a, I heard an interesting presentation on that this morning but uh, that's another topic but um yeah so you were at that point with the school that hadn't done anything yeah so the, the school didn't um didn't take action and it was it was really disappointing because um it has an impact it has an, it had an impact on my son he just wasn't conscious of it but those those types of things uh, happen every day to 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 the black kids in in school, whether they get uh, uh, disciplined more than other students, or they don't get the benefit of the doubt, or you know whatever the case may be. And you know if it's not conscious, it's subconscious that you know they're they're not as they start to feel like you know there's something wrong with them, and they're not as good as, or they can't compete, and then once a child loses that confidence and that that hope and those dreams <laughs> we all know what you know happens yeah. right they go in the opposite yeah. direction right yeah yeah <laughs> you know so um it's just it was a, it was a perfect example of uh the type types of of uh i'm not going to say racism but the type of prejudice and um Insensitivity, is it? <laughs> insensitivity, yeah, that's yeah. A, <laughs> it's, yeah. Insensitivity would probably be the best word. Yes. Yeah, because I, I, I mean, I look back, and you know, hopefully, I haven't said anything here that offends someone. But I mean, it's always my words that have probably been the most offensive things I've said, and uh, m most times just because I'm trying to make a joke or something stupid, right? But and and, and yet it hurts people, right? Well, we live in a. Um... Well, there's two things. One is that we're living in a, a, a hypersensitive world right now, where you know everybody's afraid to say anything because right. it's gonna be offensive. And then there's things that are just patently offensive. Right. You know, it's kind of like you know it when you see it. Right. <laughs> you know, right. It's not like gray. It's just like that's offensive. Yeah. Yeah. You know. Yeah, and it sounded like some of these things were just you know offensive, right? Yeah. Exactly. It wasn't. It wasn't something, it, and one day I'll, I'll show you the yearbook. When you read something, yeah. you go, okay, this wasn't great. <laughs> no, yeah. No, 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 I know. And I just, uh, but it is, um, uh, it, it does, words matter, right? I mean, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. And it's also the audience, too. Uh, sure. 
you can joke and say things around, you know, your family, you know, close group of friends. You have, you know, close um, black friends. You could say certain things too that you wouldn't say to a random black person. Right. You know, right. so yeah, people just have to understand context and situation right. and just use common sense on what's appropriate and what's not appropriate. Yeah, no, that makes sense. From um, just going back a little bit, so you you graduate UC Davis. What happens then? So I graduate from UC Davis and I start my career. I move down to the Bay Area, and I get a job at General Electric. Okay. In San Jose, at their um, power oh, generation. Uh, oh, down by Monterey Highway there. And yeah, on, on Curtin. Curtin. Yeah. And so um, I was living in Oakland and commuting to San Jose. Oh my gosh. And, uh, and so, uh, what prompted you to come to San Jose though? I mean, why? Well, that's where the job was. And I, I okay. wanted to work for GE and that's where the job was. And yeah. And they, um, they had a, a what they called a financial management program that I was attracted to. Um, so I, I got into the financial management program, worked in at their uh, San, uh, San Jose facility for two years. And then I was transferred up to Oakland. They had a, facility up in Oakland that where I worked. And so I did that for four years. And then uh, the plan was always to go back to business school. Okay. I go to business school and to get my MBA. So I did that for four years. At the same time, I was applying to business schools. I got into Berkeley and and I went there and to get my MBA. Now, was that a full-time It was full-time, yes. So while I was there, um, I met my future wife who was ah. in the part-time MBA program and uh, graduated um, with, with the work, uh, actually working in Oakland. Uh, mm -hmm. And she was down in San Jose and I had jobs at Clorox and AT&T, oh, yeah. but I was always in, you know, either Oakland or San Ramon or San Francisco. And uh, so I wanted to stay in Oakland. And, and live in Oakland. And once we decided to get married, she wanted to stay in San Jose. She had a place in San Jose. I had a place in Oakland. She wanted to stay there in, in San Jose. I wanted to stay in Oakland. So we compromised and I moved to San Jose. <laughs> <laughs> That's fine. And, but that explains why you kind of have a soft spot. I know uh, you've talked about the idea of how, you know, you can revitalize like the Coliseum area and so forth, but that exactly. explains probably your soft spot for Oakland. Big time A's and Raiders fan. Uh, I grew up in Sacramento. You know, you kind of could choose whether you want to be a 49ers, Giants fan or A's, Raiders fan or, you know, Giants, Raiders fan. I mean, you can yeah. pretty much pick what you wanted. But I was always an East Bay you know, Raiders, A's person. Okay. And that's that's where my love of those teams came from. So it was Kelly that brought you to the South Bay then? Yes, okay. she, was, she was the magnet that, that brought me down here. So from there, um, I uh, was working at AT&T for, for a while. Uh, wanted, I, I always had this entrepreneurial uh, part of me, that an itch that, that I wanted to scratch. So I, I left AT&T and went to work uh, with a very good friend who had a small uh, consulting business. And his uh, area of expertise was construction, construction management. But he he started this IT group just kind of out on a whim. Hmm. And he got like, a little small contract, four employees. So he brought me in. He said, Chappie, I want you to, to run the, the IT team and group and so I can focus in on all this other stuff I'm doing. So he brought me in and I was able to, within a couple of years, grow it from four employees to 50. Wow. And we were actually managing the California Army National Guard's IT help desk and support throughout the state of California, as well as other other contracts. Okay. So it was a, a great time in my life. I was able to kind of get that entrepreneurial itch scratched and, uh, mm -hmm. and do some really fun stuff. Uh, so I had to go back to... Um, to corporate America. So I went actually went back to AT&T for a while and then eventually moved on to Apple. So and was that AT&T uh, the, the mobile group or was it long distance or? I was in the um, 
in, in the corporate, originally in the corporate facility when it was Pac Bell. In oh, San okay. Rico. Yeah. And I was on the marketing side. And then I, I went over to the account management side of the business. Okay. Yeah. So I was uh, uh, mid market, um, global market. So at, at one point I had uh, clients like uh, Bechtel and The Gap, Levi Strauss. Those were all my customers. I was okay. I had their global business. But that was through Pac Bell then, though? Or, or, uh... Eventually it was Pac Bell, then SBC, and then. Yeah. SBC. Were you there that long then through the mergers of uh, SBC requiring it and so forth? I was I was there when Pac Bell got acquired by SBC. Okay. Then I left, and then when I came back, it was AT and T. Okay. So I didn't actually have to go through the AT and T SBC. Yeah. Merger. So anyway, um, so that was that was a great experience. But the whole time, you know, I, I was married, and at this point, it was probably nineteen. 19 years, I kept talking about what I really wanted to do in my life, and that was to to be a public servant and run for public office. And about that time, Kelly, my wife, just got fed up hearing me talking about it. She said, <laughs> you know, he, he, damn it, just either do it or shut up. I never want to hear it again. Yeah. And I was working at Apple at the time, and so I'm like, okay. And so I called my, my boss and I said, I'm going to give you four months notice. I'm going to leave Apple and I'm going to campaign full time and, and run for city council. And that's what I did. And so, so you, you did that. You, you quit Apple then to campaign full time. Huh? Full time, Yes. I didn't realize that. Yeah. That was a, in hindsight, you know, I, it really hit, hits me how, how bold of like, <laughs> I guess yeah. what that is. well, and the return on investment was probably negative if you look at it just from a financial standpoint, you right? Know, financially, you know, it was a good return on investment, but in terms yeah. of uh, you know satisfaction and looking back at your life and you know knowing that you at least tried yeah. to accomplish some of the things that you set out to do. Um, one was uh, to work at you know big companies, which I was able to do. Uh, another one was to do something entrepreneurial. Which I was able to do. Actually, one of them was to work at Apple. I, I always had a. Oh, okay. You know, I was a big Apple guy since like the '80s, you know, the early '80s, and that's like a lot, a lot of people who work at Apple have that kind of goal, right? To work yeah, there. Right? Yeah, no, it was. And then also to run for for public office and actually serve. So uh, there's there are a few other things that I, I want to accomplish in my life, but. I, I think I can, you know, when I'm eight years old and I'm in a rocking chair and I'm looking back on my life, I, I think I can have a smile to say, you know, I did accomplish several of the big things I wanted to accomplish in my life. Well, that's uh, that's that's good to hear. I mean, it's it's uh, nice to hear um, success stories, right? And success being that you're you've had a goal, you had the objectives, and you, you know, you've got they made them true, come yeah. true. And then, you know, on, on the personal side, you know, I wa always wanted to have, you know, a family and, you know, um, raise, you know, good, honest, decent children who, you know, are going to contribute to society and and create a, a loving household. And I feel like I was able to accomplish that. So, you know, professionally and personally, I, I consider myself extremely fortunate. Yeah, I mean, and clearly the, that's the most important level of success, right? To be able to continue the kind of the legacy, if you will, and right. you know, functioning, yeah. contributing citizens. So, you know, being an elected official is a tough job. And I've had people um, threaten me, not physically, but threaten me politically. Like, you know, if I don't vote a certain way or I don't do this, then, you know, my political career and life are, are going to be over and, you know, the community is going to turn against me and and what, what I tell them is that I have a family that loves me and I have lots of friends who love me and care for me, I'm gonna be all right, mm -hmm. I'm gonna be good. And every time I've said that, the person who's trying to threaten me about anything doesn't really have anything else to say. Yeah, It's kind of it's kind of like that ends the conversation because how, what do you say to the person after that? 
Right. Well, it's kind of like when you have nothing to lose, uh, <laughs> right? I mean, in that sense, uh, yeah. In, in this case, you have, uh, you know, what can they really do to you, right? You've got exactly. what you need. Yeah. Exactly. You know, especially well, when, you know, you're, you're surrounded with, you know, love and people who care for you and, you know, are in your corner regardless of, you know, what happens. It's kind of like there's no there's nowhere else that they can go with it or threaten you about it because that's the ultimate. <laughs> right. Well, and I think that important thing is that, um, you, you know, people may disagree on a lot of particular policy issues or whatever, but you know, we've got to get back to the humanity of it all too, right? Um, as far as the, um, uh, if we're going to keep going, we're going to, we're going to have to learn how to disagree and move forward. Yeah. And just, you know, also try to give people the benefit of the, of the doubt that they have the best intentions or their heart and spirit are in the right place. I mean, you and I have disagreed on things. Ken. Exactly. I, I've never walked away from our disagreements feeling like your heart and your intentions were in, were in the right place. And I'm hoping that you feel the same. No, I was going to say that. I, I was actually going to articulate that earlier in the uh, conversation, and I didn't do so. But uh, uh, that's one thing I think that could be added to your legacy, you know, when you leave office, that, uh, you know, your intentions, you are always trying to do what was right for the people who lived in you know, the area you represented. And beyond that, clearly, I mean, you look at the city level too. And I think that's why you're vice mayor. Yeah, well, all you can do is try to try and do the best you can. There's no, right. there's no, uh, there's no crystal ball <laughs> when you make a decision. Yeah. There's nothing that a sign that pops up that says, this is absolutely guaranteed to be the right decision. Right. You have to take all the information in Make the best decision you can and just keep keep moving. Yeah. I, I, well, wish, I wish there okay. were like a neon sign or something that says, Chappie, here's, yeah. the, here's the positively the right decision. If right. You this, it's, you know. Well, and then even looking back, right? If you looking back in history, it's hard to tell what was, well, gosh, if they'd done this, then this. You know, I mean, it's, it's really difficult for us mortals to, uh, to have absolutes. <laughs> I mean, well, you you kind of have to even like take this perspective that assuming someone wasn't either a, a complete moron or just evil, most people, if they're making a decision, they're not going to say, okay, this is the world's worst decision and this is going to be a complete disaster. So this is what I'm going to do. I, I don't think in the, I don't think that happens very often. Yeah. I think people have, facts and opinions and different information and in context and you just try to put it all together and make you know what are oftentimes very difficult decisions with unknown outcomes but the only the only way that you would know that that was a good decision is in hindsight right. if you had to make the decision they have the hindsight. Hindsight, yeah. Yeah, it was a good decision. Yeah, yeah no, we, I was just listening to this podcast, and I'll send it to you if you're interested. Uh, um, but it was uh, one of my favorite professors, uh, my favorite professor, I'll, I'll say it, Alan Kornhauser, the fellow from Princeton. Uh, and he was interviewing, um, forgot the gentleman's name, but he's looking at um, mobility and, and racial equity. And, you know, they were talking about just some of the things that at the time, um, you know, people were probably just thinking, okay, we got to move people and move cars as quickly as possible. Let's just throw up an interstate, right? And the, 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 what it did to, into the communities. Now, I don't even think that initially the interstates were supposed to go through the cities. That happened kind of after where they started putting the freeways up. But, you know, it devastated a lot of uh, communities. Yes, it did. Yes, it did. And, and, and I'm sure that, you know, they weren't sitting there going, you know, let's, let's have this interstate go through. Um, the middle of uh, the black community uh, and devastated. I don't, I don't yeah. think that was their thought process. I think it was, what's the most efficient way to- Right, well that and hard. probably cheap, cheapest land and probably the least resistance, right? I mean, yeah, if you're busy working, you know, two jobs, 16 hours a day, you don't have a lot of resistance. You know, you can't go to court and say, you know, change this freeway, right? Right, right. Uh, so a lot of it, I. 
I, I, and I think that's an important point. I mean, people, you know, say it's a racist thing. Well, it isn't always. It's always. It's sometimes it's the path of least resistance, and the people, you know, it could be poor people of any stripe, right, that get yeah. kind of pushed aside yeah. in this scenario. Well, well, that's why they talk about systemic racism, Ken, because when it's systemic, you don't even have to be conscious of it. You don't right. even have to be engaged in it. It's just happening. Naturally. But but in some scenarios, it's almost systemic. It goes beyond race, right? I mean, in that scenario, you know, whether that neighbor that neighborhood could have been a poor white neighborhood, poor Latino neighborhood, whatever, right? So yeah. it just happened that there's these other factors that played it, you know, played into it. Yeah, but, no, definitely. But then because you have higher concentrations of poverty, right, in the black and Latino neighborhood, then exactly. the higher probability that that's going to be the neighborhood. Exactly. Right. And, and, I, I don't know what you call that systemic. I don't know what it would be called, but it, there, it's it's expensive to be poor, right? It's expensive to be poor, but kind of going back to the point I was trying to make, and I even though I experienced a lot of it, um, I wasn't as necessarily totally conscious of how it's pervasive in terms of all aspects of our life where, you know, there's blatant things like I told you about, you know, my parents' inability to buy a house further into the neighborhood where right. we live. I mean, those those are pretty blatant things, but um, there's also things that are just subtle, like, um, you know, the story I told you about the fact that, you know, my car was searched when it really shouldn't have been. And, right. you know, I could have been arrested when I shouldn't have been. And, Right. And then, you know, I, I don't know where that would have gone, but just say just hypothetically that, you know, I was convicted of a misdemeanor or a felony or whatever. And then I'd have that on my record and then I wouldn't right. be, able to, you know, get right. work at General Electric. And, you know, yeah. I mean, yeah, just, we're not talking today. We're yeah. not talking today. Yeah. And so, th again, those are the the systemic things that just really take people in, in different directions. And, you know, when you see uh, black folks who are getting arrested for crimes or, you know, other things and you say, well, okay, well, you know, those were decisions that they made. And, and yes, you know, those are decisions that people make. And if you commit a crime, you, should, you know, you should face the consequences. But then there needs to be a dialogue in terms of how did that person get to that point? Right. And, and, and what I mean by that is I, I've had an opportunity to engage and work with and interact with a lot of young people, particularly in elementary school. And I can tell you, Ken, with one exception, and I remember this kid from 30 years ago, with one exception, every first grader, second grader, third grader, fourth grader I've ever met in my life had a heart of gold. Mm -hmm. And something happens, particularly when they get in the sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade, something something happens and that that heart of gold turns cold and part of it is just you know our society you know the you have those again those means of interactions that i described earlier that that wear on a person's psyche mm -hmm. you have a lack of hope and you have a lack of opportunity um most people if they're rational will not go into a life of crime if they have hope and aspirations and the opportunity to, to do something constructive. Yeah. Except for there, there is a segment of, of, of the population, I call them bad seeds. They were just born bad. Yeah. <laughs> regardless, yeah. regardless yeah. you know, that, that goes across races, genders, everything. Just some people right. are just, just born bad. But you're right though, it, it gets reinforced, all, right? If you're you know, told that you're dumb or whatever it is, right? You're going to think that after a while. Yeah. You're going to, you're going to think that you're not as smart as someone else. You're going to think that, you know, you can't achieve what other people can achieve. You're going to start to think that why even try? Because mm -hmm. there's no hope. Right. And then you, then you change the direction of your life. And if, if we don't address that, we're just going to be caught in this this loop of, you know, why you know why doesn't the black community just get their act together? Right. You know, they should solve this among themselves. 
And unless there's an understanding that the greater community, particularly the white community, has a part in this, a part in creating the, the systemic mm -hmm. you know, structure that we have right now, and they play a part in terms of solving it. Because you know, you can't have a race and you and one person in that race has has their leg cut off. And you say race at go. And then when that person always loses that race, you can't go back to them and say, How come you can't get your act together and solve right. and, and solve your problem? It's like, hey, my leg's been cut off. I need right. you know, I need somebody to either, you know, get me a prosthetic leg or you know, give me a head start or something so that we can have a, a, a fair race and a fair competition. Yeah, no, that's um, it, it, what's so sad is there's, there's so, so much potential um, that is just going to waste. Right. I mean, it's that's the part that there could be so much more. And um, and, and yet a lot of when you don't have hope, the potential never is, is seen. It's, it's never realized. Yeah. You know, again, I had I had the opportunity again to grow up with literally different races, religions, people in different circumstances, rich, poor, middle class, and I I've met people who are were amazingly smart in, in all the races, all the groups, all the religions, and I saw different groups people who are really smart were able to, to rise and obtain their, their dreams and hopes. And I've seen other people who were just as smart, if not smarter, who ended up going in a different direction because of those opportunities or those, those hopes or dreams were not available to them. Yeah. And, you know, and we can't afford in this competitive you know, world that we live in to waste any person who has the potential to do great things. Yeah, especially here in Silicon Valley, where um, there seems to be a, a huge divide as you go from west to east or east bay to west bay or whatever. And, and there's just so much untapped potential that we're not, yeah. you know, that aren't coming into Silicon Valley and working, you know, in the high tech jobs. Right. Yeah. And then you find yourself in a situation where, you know, we're always trying to promote job growth. But now we have the dynamic where, you know, we bring in a Google, we bring in Facebook, whatever, and they're bringing in employees from out of the region, out of the state, out of the country to come in and work those jobs. And it's really not benefiting the local population because they're not able to, to get hired for those, you know, right. really high paying good jobs. It's creating, you know, waiter jobs and it's creating, right. you know, low paying employment. But it's really not creating those kind of high high wage, um, high salary jobs that you'd want your local population to be able to to, to uh, take advantage of. And the ironic thing is now, you know, some of these companies are are saying, well, we're going to go to other cities like Austin and Nashville and Portland and other places. And I, I was I went on a city tour in Nashville, and they're about ten years behind us. But those companies are moving into Nashville now, and they're already starting to see those same types of problems and impacts that we're, we're grappling with here in Silicon Valley. Uh, lower income folks are being priced out of their, mm -hmm. their apartments. And, and even though right now, I mean, an expensive apartment in Nashville might be $1,000. If, you, uh, if you're a low wage you know, worker in, in Nashville, that thousand dollars might be out of your price range. And so they're right. starting to get, you know, priced out. And if someone doesn't figure out a way to create a, a pathway for the local population to get educated, trained and qualified to take these jobs, if you think uh, there's a, a tech lash now, just wait. Yeah, it'll be it'll be a lot worse. No, I, I think you're right. There's an element here that's probably beyond the scope of this conversation about the whole education <laughs> system and how can it, you know, adapt to what is needed in industry and how can industry help it and so forth. Yes. So um, we'll see. So uh, I, I really appreciate your uh, your 
time here, Chappie. I don't know if there's any other stories you want to relate, something we haven't, you know, kind of uh, uh, already touched upon. Um, but uh, actually, I told a, a good story when you, uh, you're still recording. Yeah. But, uh, but I told a good story about my daughter oh. that you can. Uh, oh, OK. You can uh, you can you can also use. Um, but uh, a, co a couple of things. One is that um, I'm 60 years old. And I've seen a lot, you know, I lived through the 60s, lived through, you know, 1968 and the 70s where, you know, the anti-war movement and- It was know. pretty depressing time then. You had stagflation, you had- uh, Oh yeah, you know, hostages. Jimmy, yeah, it cost Jimmy Carter his job. Yeah. Uh, so I, I've seen- Gas lines. Yeah, I've seen a lot of that. I don't know if I've ever seen a moment like this in terms of a tipping point, I mean, if you read Malcolm Gladwell's, you know, book Tipping Point, you know, there's there's certain things that happen and certain people that make them happen at the right time that, that cause a major shift in attitudes or whatever that that shift is. I see that happening right now, and I think a lot of it is driven by young people. You know, Gen Xers or Gen Z or you know, uh, millennials, uh, younger people who are are also staying up. Particularly younger white folks who are just staying up and saying, you know, the status quo is no longer acceptable. And I think you're going to see this around race relations. I think you're going to see this around climate, and you're going to see this around like gun gun control. I think some of the major issues that we're facing as a society, I'm looking to the young people to really be at the forefront and, and, and drive that change because I I see it happening. I, I see something different. I don't know if it's in the water, it's in the air, but I, I see it and I'm looking forward to uh, more change coming. Well, definitely uh, we're in interesting times and uh, and it would have been nice to actually be uh, in person together, but this is much safer uh, in today's world. So yeah. <laughs> we, we uh, I'm not coughing on you, so that's a good thing. Oh, I appreciate so. that. <laughs> so I, I really appreciate your time, uh, Vice Mayor, and uh, look forward to uh, when we can actually meet again in person. I do too. Thank you, Ken. And thank you. Uh,